uh, I think where I first heard the, the, the term tribalism referred to in an American context was uh, one of your columns, uh, Dave, maybe six months ago or so. And, uh, and that struck a chord with me. Uh, another line that has struck a chord by another one of David's uh, colleagues is a line by uh, the presidential historian John Meacham, who not long ago gave the eulogy for former First Lady Barbara Bush. And in some remarks, he reflected that we are at an existential moment as a country, an existential moment. And um, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, you know, when I was in the Marine Corps, I, I saw some of the effects of, of tribalism firsthand in places like the Horn of Africa, Iraq, Bosnia. Um, I would never have imagined that those forces that have created such violence elsewhere around the world um, would be here at the United States. But, but they are. They're, they're here. They're not, as, they're not at yet violent, at least in the context of a civil war or ethnic conflict. And they're not as seemingly impossible to deal with as they are in, in, in places affected by, by conflict and, and violence. But they're here. Um, and so uh, what we are doing as an organization is, uh, is setting up a way to address our polarization. And on a personal level, it's a way for me to sort of answer a call to serve again, but in a more entrepreneurial way and hopefully do something meaningful for, for this country, which has given me and my, uh, my family so much. Um, you know, the, the frustrations with Congress are, uh, in particular, are no surprise. Uh, in our organization, we have an advisory board member, a uh, famous uh, business strategist, uh, Michael Porter, who uh, has just completed a four-year study on U.S. competitiveness. Four years, large study, and he concluded that the single greatest internal threat, internal threat in the United States, uh, to our economic competitiveness is our political polarization, particularly in Congress. Um, it, 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 it prohibits the uh, you know, rational decision making and frankly just getting things done that, that business and you know, society at a core depends on. Um, it, it's obviously no surprise to any Americans. We all feel the, the frustration, um, the level of trust in Congress maybe at an all-time low, or at least within our lifetimes, is at an extremely low level. Uh, there's one survey that suggested that the trust and confidence has just dropped below that of, of used car salespeople, um, which, you know, might spark a laugh, but it, and often sparks a laugh, but is, like, is really a sad fact um, because, of course, we are... We're a can-do country. You know, we have been an example for others in this experiment of democracy. We can do better. We can figure things out. We have to do better. And so what we're trying to do with, with, with Honor uh, as a movement, as a super PAC that's helping to lower barriers of entry for veterans is, is, to, is to address polarization through veterans and, frankly, to a certain extent, tie into the trust and confidence in the only public institution in the United States where trust has actually risen over the last, and rising over the last 10 years. And that's the, the US military. And it has trust across both, both party lines. Um, let me just show one piece of data uh, that I think um, was our entry point into thinking about why veterans can be part of this solution. What this is is a, is a scatter diagram that goes back to 1951. And all of the Congress people are in blue and red. And the, the gray lines in between those dots are how Congress folks are voting across party lines on pieces of legislation. And we go out each, you know, every 10, 15, 20 years to where we live today in this polarized environment. Uh, it just so happens that veteran representation has also dropped from 70% to 20%. Um, now, when we first started this organization about a year and a half ago with a group of, of veterans, uh, we didn't know whether this was more than just correlated. So we did a study. And we did a study with the Luger Center and an advisor of ours who's a professor of political science at Stanford, Larry Diamond. And what the study looked at was, uh, you know, how have veterans voted over the last 50 years versus non-veterans? And there were really interesting conclusions. And, and the conclusion was that veterans have voted in a more cross-partisan way. We like to refer to it as a cross-partisan organization because we're backing and are open to backing both Democrats, Republicans, and independents and third-party candidates. So they've acted in a more cross-partisan way. Now, that doesn't mean that all veterans are part of the solution. It does not mean that. 
but many can be. And so I'll talk about what we're doing and how we selected veterans in a moment, but let me just take a step back and, 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 and speak to a larger question, which is why veterans? You know, beyond the, the, the cross-partisan data, why veterans? And I think it really comes down to service. Um, you know, veterans, uh, particularly those that served after September 11th, which is really the focus of our organization, um, have taken an oath to, to, to support and defend the Constitution, to serve something that's larger than themselves. They've done it. They've put, their, they put skin in the game. And by doing so in the military, they've come across and interacted with Americans from all walks of life. Um, you know, when I was in the Marine Corps, uh, <laughs> I didn't know the political party of most of the Marines that I served with. Uh, and if I did, it didn't matter. You know, we were there to accomplish a mission that, that was uh, larger than ourselves. Um, so why are there fewer veterans? You know, most people will look at this and say, oh, well, of course there are fewer veterans. There are fewer veterans in the population. And that's true. However, the decline in veterans in Congress has been far more rapid than the decline of veterans in the population. And when you talk to younger veterans in particular, there are about 10 of them who have a small coalition. It is cross-partisan. They're from both parties. There are only 10, but there are 10 in the House. And when you talk to them, they say, listen, the, 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 the game, the, it, 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 it's changed over the last 20 years. And why has it changed? Because of the absurd soaring costs in our elections. This is a slide that shows the rise of costs in campaigns. It's gone up higher than any other index um, over, over five times over the last 20 years. And it has created a disproportionate barrier to entry for, frankly, anybody that's not part of the affluent or politically elite class. And you know, that, that, that is the situation for most of the, the over 400 veterans that are now running for in, in, the, in the US House. Um, so what we do as an organization is we help lower those barriers to entry by investing in those races and helping them win as a super PAC with independent expenditures. But first, we go through a really detailed selection process. And the selection process to become a with honor candidate, there are 30 of them now, uh, starts with values and starts with character. And we have a pledge. And the pledge is, is here. Uh, and we wrote it with two members, uh, Republican and Democrat. And they establish some you know, basic values that are so essential for, for effective public leadership and which we obviously need to restore in our civic leadership in the United States. But there are also some really specific actions. And maybe most importantly is the commitment to serve on this cross-partisan coalition. Because what we're trying to do as an organization is actually build a fulcrum within the House of veterans that can work across party lines and get things done. And it's possible. It's possible because this cycle, you have this surge of veteran candidates that are running. There are basically two surges that are happening. There's a surge in women candidates, and there's a surge in veterans. And actually, some of the strongest veteran candidates are women. We had a great panel yesterday that went 30 minutes over where one of the women candidates who we've endorsed, uh, who's a Republican, Ashley Nichols, running in a uh, a, a very conservative district in Tennessee, spoke with uh, an, another Democratic candidate and a, a number of different uh, pollsters. And, um, and they talked about you know, getting things done and, making, and building coalitions. It's not easy for sure, but this is where, where we think it can start. So what do we do as an organization? We are a super PAC. Why does that matter? Many of you here probably contribute to candidates. Uh, individual contributions are limited to a few thousand dollars. And unfortunately, this day and age, because of the cost, that's just, it's just not enough to win elections. The average cost of a House race is $4 million. The average cost of Senate races is 20 to 30. Some have gotten over $100 million. Um, it's absurd. Uh, but what we've done is we've raised about $10 million. We're raising a total of about 30. We invest early into, in, into races, and we help really win those races and lower the barriers to entry. And I have just two examples, and then we'll turn to the, the conversation uh, of, of what we do. Uh, the first is, uh, is the race that you saw from the Fox News video, re uh, medically retired Navy SEAL Dan Crenshaw. He was running in a, uh, a conservative district in, in Houston, Texas. Uh, when he, he's 34 years old, got a graduate degree, moves back to his, his home district. When he started running, all of the political types said, don't bother with this race. 
he may be a perfectly fine person, but there is no way that he can win. Why? Because he's running against two self-funders who both have the capacity to put over a million dollars of their own money into the race. And they did. One put more than six million dollars of their own capital into the race. That individual has not held a professional job, but six million dollars of capital into the race. They went negative, they said some things they probably shouldn't have said. Dan Crenshaw ran a, an effective race. We invested significantly, about $600,000. He won by 145 votes. And that is a safe district, and he should be the next uh, representative in the US House. He'll be part of our cross-partisan coalition. So Amy McGrath starts running a race. She was 40 points behind in our poll uh, about four months ago. We had endorsed her, but she was 40 points behind. Seemed like it was impossible. She started closing the gap. The Democratic Party supported the other candidate running against her, who was a more popular, uh, well, it, bottom line is, was somebody that was a politician, also had some ability to self-fund. We were the only group that came in with outside support for Amy McGrath. Um, she started closing the, the gap. And about a week before the, the election, her opponent broke his pledge to not go negative and went negative with an advertisement that said that Amy McGrath is not qualified to be a representative in this district because she has not been in the district for the last 20 years. Yeah, so why has she not been in the district for the last 20 years? Uh, because she's been flying F-18s. So one of our other advisory board members is a former commandant of the Marine Corps, actually the only commandant to have ever been an aviator, and he flew with Amy McGrath in an F-18 over Iraq. And he said, I will not endorse candidates because that's not appropriate as a four-star general, but I can speak on behalf of veterans across the country who are running and get attacked like this. And he called the ads shameful and unpatriotic. unpatriotic. Time Magazine ran it. Amy McGrath won by a few points, and now she's in a tough general <coughs> election. Uh, and those are two of 30 candidates that we've endorsed. These are some of their, their photographs. They're running across the country, and it's really a, it's really a glimmer of hope in what at times can be a very depressing uh, environment. Um, unless you're reading David's columns, of course, and you're... Uh, <laughs> um, so let me just, just uh, offer this one last point in conclusion, which is um, another member of our advisory board is former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, who served under eight presidents from both parties. And he just uh, participated in a cover story for the Christian Science Monitor, and he offered this quote which I think is really appropriate, and that, that is, things aren't working. There needs to be a change in attitude and philosophy and outlook in the people serving in Congress. Uh, polarization has led to paralysis. Um, so let me stop there. That's a little bit about With Honor. Um, David, thanks so much for being willing to do this. As, as many of you may know, David's dance card is especially full today. I, I think he's booked on five different uh, panels and was up late last night, and so... Uh, really appreciate you having here, and maybe, uh, maybe, maybe if you'd like. Uh, obviously, you're you're asking the questions, but if you want, and offer just some reflections on. Okay. Uh, yeah. First, I'm reminded when John McCain first ran for Congress, uh, he was also challenged why you haven't lived in Arizona long enough. And in the first debate of that campaign, he said, "I guess the longest place I've lived was in a bamboo cage in Hanoi," <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and that was sort of ended that issue. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I first want to talk about you for a second, because we've known each other for a few years. And one of the things that's inspiring about members of, of vets in, the, um, in Congress is not only what military service did for them, but why they enlisted in military service. Yep. And so I just wanted you to walk through how you got to be a Marine, what you did in Nairobi after the Marine Corps, Thank you. And, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, thanks. So uh, my father's a Vietnam veteran. And like many Vietnam veterans, uh, he, was not, he was not drafted. He volunteered early in 1965. And like many Vietnam veterans, he is deeply torn by that experience because um, uh, it wounded him in some pretty significant ways. He was actually shot in the face uh, and somehow survived. Uh, but he also values that as one of the most meaningful experiences uh, of his life. And so he was pretty ambivalent when at age 13 I said, I wanted to uh, uh, make a difference in the world by signing up for the Marine Corps. And so I, I, at a pretty early age, I thought that was going to be my path, in large part because of him and because of some of the early mentors in my life. It was the best decision I could have made. Um, I mean, I've been fortunate to have some, some great education, both uh, with my family and, and also in, in some of our great institutions, but no better education than the Marine Corps. Um, the average age of, Marine, of a Marine, can anybody guess what the average age of Marine is? Yeah, it's, it's, it's 22. 
the average. So you have like 60% of the Marine Corps that's under the age of, of, uh, of you know, 23, 24. Anyways, th these are young Americans, and they are put into, especially at times of conflict, put into very difficult positions and positions that require leadership and require stepping up. So I was very fortunate to have that experience. I knew I was going into the military at an early age, and that I wanted to better understand why ethnic conflict was happening around the world. And so when I was in a college student, um, went over to a large informal settlement in Nairobi, Kenya, which David came and visited, uh, called Kibera. Uh, it's been affected by ethnic violence, and uh, wanted to basically did a study as a college student, and that later became a nonprofit organization called Carolina for Kibera, which is now 18 years old and 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 helps prevent violence in in uh, in this informal settlement in, in Nairobi. And what both of those that what both what that experience really br opened my eyes to was entrepreneurship and social entre entrepreneurship and the ability to to get things done that, that matter in the world by bringing together good people and listening to folks and what they have to say on the ground. Um, you know, not just in environments like Aspen, but, but on the ground in difficult places. Um, I, after leaving the Marine Corps, went into an entrepreneurship from in the private sector, was fortunate to start a business. Uh, the business was, was successful uh, enough for my business partner to decide that he uh, is going to answer the call to serve again by running for Congress. So my former business partner is running for Congress. Uh, he's one of our 30 endorsed candidates, um, and he has you know four kids under the age of eight. Uh, it's hard. It's a real sacrifice. He's doing it to serve again, and frankly, to try and try and create something that can that can really get something done and do, and do things differently. Uh, so that was my that's that's a little bit of the personal entry into this. Thanks for asking. Now. Um you know, I was at actually at an event in Baltimore, uh, and I was confronted by a, mar a former Marine or a current Marine. I guess you're never a former Marine. And he said, you know, I felt such esprit de corps when I was in the Marine Corps. Now I'm working in some company. I don't feel it. And you do get that sense from a lot of vets that they, they tasted that sense of total service. Uh, and so there's, it's just a great experience. But they do enter a system, a political environment when they go to Congress, which is pretty noxious. And so the question to me is, okay, you got great people who've served a great cause, but they go into a system where party loyalty is the number one priority, and polarization is just in the air. And so, for example, there's a guy named Tom Cotton, who's a senator from Arkansas, who's a fantastic guy, uh, and he served uh, very bravely. And in Congress, whatever you think of his views, you wouldn't say he's changed the tone of the place. He's a pretty conventional Republican. And so why should we think that the people you're electing will not be influenced by the environment they come across in Capitol Hill? Yeah. I, I, if I may, I'd like to address the question, and, and, and first on the first part about the mission as well. For, because for many of the candidates, one of the things about the military is that you, you and you've written about this in Road to Character, in other orbits as well, is that you, 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 you submerge the self, you know? You put the unit first. You don't talk about yourself, you know? I mean, that, you, you just, you have a certain standard of, of humility. And what does it take to win an election these days? I'll tell you what, the candidates that are gonna win are basically on the phone for 11 hours calling strangers, t pitching themselves. It's not, it's, it's a deeply unsettling experience and it's not really aligned with a lot of the, <laughs> frankly, what you learn, you learn in the military. You do learn to accomplish the mission. So, the, so many of them are adapting and kind of getting up the curve. And what we're trying to do is, is help lower those barriers to entry by also com coming in and providing, uh, you know, defining support as an organization. On your question, I, I, I believe, after seeing the data, that basically no single individual can fix this in Congress. It's too large for any individual. But it is possible if you have a coalition that has meaningful enough size and resources, the House in particular is so divided that it can have disproportionate influence. And the, the example of this, whether you agree with the policies or not, the example of the influence and the cohesion is the Freedom Caucus, you know, which has a sizable number and, 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 and essentially the House is pivoting on, uh, on certain, uh, at, at times on certain you know, positions that they take. And so our goal as an organization is to get to that critical mass and have some real resources behind it so that we can start to change that, that dialogue. Um, I don't think any individual is, a, is particularly a, a, a key part of the solution. I also don't think all veterans are, are necessarily more um, uh, 
uh, bipartisan or cross-partisan. And that's part of the reason why we go through a really extensive selection process and have only endorsed 30 out of, out of over 40. Um, and those 30 are really deeply committed to it. And, you know, some, might, some may end up violating the, the pledge. And what do we do with that if they violate the pledge? Well, you know, we've learned from some of the groups that are out there that support women candidates on both sides and other groups. And, you know, you can, you, there, there are carrots and sticks. There's ways to support candidates that can also be delisted from the organization. There are ways of actually measuring how you cross, you know, vote, vote across party lines. So that's what we're intending to do is really build an organization that can help start both change the dialogue, but also how functionally how the Congress is working. I'm reminded when you told that story about the, having to talk about yourself in the donor calls, when George H.W. Bush was running for president, he was raised with an ethos, which is you know, probably an aviator ethos, which is you never talk about yourself. And so his staff would write speeches in which he was supposed to say what a great candidate he was and what a great president he would be, and he would chop out those paragraphs. And his staff beat him up and said, you're running for president, you've got to talk about how great you are. Uh, and so finally he did it, and he read out the paragraph about himself, and his mom, who was still alive, called him up and said, George, you're talking about yourself. <laughs> and, he, and he never did it again. <laughs> but that was that sort of an yeah. ethos. Um, now, I guess, uh, could you, t are there, you know, a lot of these, a lot of people you're supporting have served abroad in a very specific sort of conflict. We were in, in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere. Do they have common views of foreign policy? How do they process the fact that a lot of people like you, frankly, uh, served over there, and it's not seen as the greatest thing America ever did? Yeah, I think, um, I think the, 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 the views on specific policy items for foreign policy will vary. But what the data shows is that um, there's, a, there's a political scientist here who's actually done some work on this, Peter Fever, who I actually once was my, my first job in college was as an intern uh, my freshman summer to Peter Fever and Richard Cohn who were working on civil military relations. And what Fever and others have done is they've looked at national security decision making by veterans versus non-veterans over the last, again, 50 years, you know, over the course of, and they're, polit they're political scientists over the course of American history. What they have found is, is something that is intuitive, but they've put real empiricism behind that. And that is that veterans typically are less likely to commit military forces to solve problems overseas. But when they do make the decision to commit, they commit in a more defining and, and comprehensive way. It's sometimes referred to as the PAL doctrine. They commit with, with force. I think that, is, that, is, that has been what my perspective of at least the post-9-11 veterans that I know. They, they, are, they are skeptical. They ask hard questions. They don't want to just commit US forces, but, you know, for, for, particularly in conflict situations. It's different on the humanitarian assistance, et cetera. But for conflict situations, um, they, they ask hard questions. And Lord knows we need that. We need hard questions asked because whenever a country commits its forces to solve a problem overseas using violence, that is the essential decision that, that is made, and Congress should not abdicate its responsibility to do so to, um, to any president, regardless of their party. Yeah. Um, when I, my observation is when I, uh, my experience of interviewing politicians, the difference between those who've served and those who haven't is this, that those who haven't served, they look at the military either as uh, gods are as devils. <laughs> so there are some who haven't served who are completely disdainful of the military and the generals and the advice they get, and there are others who are completely worshipful. And, but people who've been in the military know, well, there's some good guys, there's some bad guys, they have a much more nuanced view of the military. Could you describe some of the other races uh, you were involved? I don't know if you were involved in the race in New Jersey with the helicopter pilot. Yeah, yeah that's Mikey Sherrill. She's one of our candidates, uh, extremely compelling candidate. Also a mother, I believe, with four children. Um, uh, was a federal prosecutor, and uh, she's never held up. She's never run, run for office before. Uh, she was running against an incumbent who decided to drop out. This is a more conservative district. He's a Republican, uh, and uh, she did something that was very smart early on. So she, veterans are often can be pretty adaptable. And what she did was she announced her candidacy. In New Jersey, there's this peculiar rule where you can't announce your candidacy if you're a sitting state representative until a certain date. And so she announced her candidacy three months before that and essentially sort of cleared the field as Democrat. Um, she's a, a very compelling uh, check her out, Mikey Sherrill. Uh, we hope to be able to uh, you know, really help support, support her getting through. And she's uh, deeply committed to the to the pledge and the organization. We, I didn't mention in the remarks, but we are, we're about 50-50 in terms of the number of candidates 
Um, there are 400 veterans, about 200 of those served after September 11th. Uh, we target funding on essentially a 50-50 basis. And, um, and uh, yeah. What's impressive about her and some of the other candidates is just how good their political skills are. Even though they're first-time candidates, when you cover a race like I do, it's like watching a pitcher in spring training. You want to know how good their stuff is. And some of these candidates, like Cheryl, they're just, they have amazing stuff. I don't, it must have been something about presenting or leading while in the service that, that translated over. Yeah, I also think, you know, deep commitment to the, to the service. And, the, and, and this, they, I mean, for her, for all of these candidates, they do feel that we are at an existential moment as a, as a country. From both parties, they do feel that this is, you know, this is a total mess. There's a line in the Marine Corps, it's a recruiting ad, that, you know, if you, if you see chaos, if you see problems around the world, do you want to stay back or do you want to run toward it? And if you want to run toward it, then you might want to think about service like in the, in the Marines. Um, and I think that's, that's true for a lot of these candidates. They see total chaos, dysfunction. It's not only dysfunction and chaos, but it's also, it's loathing, right? People loathe the politicians. They hate the politicians. The lifestyle's absolutely miserable, maybe more miserable than it's been before in the past. Why do it? To take on a hard, a hard mission, you know? Serve some. Let's go to questions from the floor. I, I will say, just to defend politicians, um, I find like the, the lifestyle is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> like they're really fundraising all the time. If you fly out of Reagan Airport in DC on a Thursday afternoon, they're all going home somewhere. The senators in first class, the House members in the back, uh, and they and they just got to. It's they, they're away. It's just yep. they wouldn't do it if they weren't in it for the right reasons. Let's go to the mic right there. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is KJ I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. Two years ago, I ran for a state house. I would have loved to have support from an organization <laughs> like this, so congrats on what you're doing. I do have a question in terms of the makeup of the people you support. Um, you talked about how you know veterans are more likely to be cross-partisan and therefore make decisions based on that. But on another level, uh, are you cognizant of the people, the type of people you're recruiting uh, veterans span different hues, different abilities, different income levels. And when I looked at the list, I mean, if I didn't know they were veterans, it would look like a regular list of the kind of people who already run for office. So are you trying to find different people to help show the, the breadth of, of veterans? Or are you, and it's okay, but are you looking for people who can win? And that's like the primary focus. It's a great question. So the way we think about it as an organization is we, we principally look at character and ability, and, but, but we are not blind to the ability to, to win the race. But we want to be in a position where we can make the defining difference and come in and really help, help get them across the goal line. Um, I think for, for most of our veteran candidates, it is, it is a cross section of the United States. Um, that being said, many of the candidates that are running are, you know, have, uh, there, are more, there are more officers, for example, than enlisted. That's not completely the case across the board, but, but there are more that, that have, uh, have had the privilege of a, of a, a strong college education. And, um, you know, but we're, we're committed to finding the diversity within the, the group. And the selection process is super important. And there are, there are also examples, many of you may be able to think of them off the top of your head, of veterans that, that have um, clearly could not live up to the pledge. They have violated their ethics. They haven't been part of the solution, and that's part of the reason why vetting is important. I, I'd say one other thing on vetting. One of the things that we did, that we do as an organization, is we not only interview the candidate and do self-research where you get big opposition, you get books on candidates, but we also talk to veterans who serve with the candidate overseas in a confidential way. We try and get three to four references. And what we found from that is that it's actually really insightful because how somebody acted under duress in uniform can show you some of their true colors. We had one, for example, where the candidate was basically, we had three, we talked to three people and they were like, listen, they, they just expressed discomfort. They said, this is too much of a phony. Like this is, they, they may, may not be running for the right reasons, maybe too wrapped up into ego, et cetera. And we didn't endorse, you know, on the candidate. But th thanks for your question and thanks for putting your name in the hat. Let's go right over here. The, uh, well, if you go wait for the microphone, it's coming. Right, right in front of you. The military draft ended in 1973. Do you think the end of the draft helps to account for the dramatic reduction in the number of veterans in Congress? Yeah. I do. I, th I think that there are two main factors. One is that, th that you have just fewer veterans in the population, in part because of the, the ending of the draft. 
Um, you know, the statistic now is that less than 1% of Americans serve uh, currently. And there, you know, is, so, so, so there are fewer in the population, but the decline in Congress has been more rapid than the decline in the population. And the other real factor here is the cost. And the cost, it's just, it's a prohibitively high barrier. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a concrete example. About, you know, it's almost a fifth of our races where the veterans running against somebody that can self-fund. And it just creates, a, it creates a major barrier. Um, you know, the ability to self-fund is, is important not only because of the dollars that go into the campaign, but the only way to capitalize a campaign with more than the hard dollar support of a few thousand dollars is, is if it's your own money. And so if you're putting in a million dollars, that's not only a million dollars, it's, you know, 5,000 calls that you don't have to make. We'll be back here. Hi, uh, thank you for your service and thank you for your work. My name is Christina Gonzalez. I direct our programs for access and inclusion at Princeton University. One of the programs that um, I oversee is our support of our veteran students and non-traditional students. Um, and one of the things I think that highly selective colleges and universities recently have turned to is how we can recruit veteran students, right, and how we can support them. Um, we have a capacity to graduate our students at much higher rates than, than less resource universities. Um, and we have a lot of the networks in place, right, that connect people with the kind of resources that you're talking about are missing in the, in the kind of campaign, right? Um, the other thing we have the capacity to do is recruit diverse veteran students, right, because of our financial capacity. So I guess I'm wondering how we can help, right? Um, how we can connect our students with, um, you know, the, the kind of work that you're doing so that we can track them through a pipeline early. Because I think one of the things that I see most is that, uh, you know, for our veteran students and for our lower income students, they see a gap between what their leadership skills are, which are super well developed and I see it in them, but what they could do, right? So I would just love to, to kind of talk about how we could how we could help well thank you for that comment and thanks to it's Princeton right where you're yeah and thanks to the, I think it's super important for our 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 all of our institute college institutions but especially our elite institutions to re-engage with the 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 vet, veteran community um, when I, I went to uh, Harvard for graduate school and Harvard brought back ROTC recently after the repeal of the don't ask don't tell policy I'd love to talk with you uh, Admiral Michael Mullen is also on our advisory board and, and is a, teaches, of course, at, at, at Princeton. Um, uh, what I have found with most enlisted, most of the military is enlisted, um, you know, and those are, and they get out when they're 23, 24 years old. What I found with a lot of the Marines that I served with is that they have no world view of getting an education at a place like a Princeton, uh, a, sta a major state university. They don't. All they've seen is the university of, uh, you know, the, the online universities. Or they'll, or they'll start accessing by community colleges. And those are great pipelines. I know the University of North Carolina, which is my alma mater, has actually created a program that targets bringing in veterans from community colleges. And it's a great program. It adds a lot of value to the campus. It adds a lot of value for the, for the students. So, uh, so thanks for doing that. I will say I teach at a school in New Haven, Connecticut that's sort of the Princeton of New Haven. Uh, <laughs> and. <laughs> And we have, we have like three or four vets in every class, and they bring another level of reality to the students. It's so valuable to have them. Like, like we had one, I had one guy who was in Iraq, and he said, I had a horrible superior one tour, and he gave me nothing but negative feedback. And in that tour, I learned to develop, I couldn't rely on outside affirmation. I had to develop my own criteria for whether I was good or not. And that's what I call maturity. And whenever that guy would talk in the class, everyone would just get silent. If somebody begins a sentence, well, on my third tour of combat in, Viet in Iraq, people tend to listen to the rest of that sentence. And it was just so useful. Can you see the moral formation? Let's go right here. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm really intrigued by, by the challenge you face and you've articulated about the, um, the mission and your goal and the political realities that you're facing. Um, I'm a school teacher of uh, many, many years, actually turning into decades. And the thing that struck me here, and in working with young people for, for over 40 years, you're trying to change the language, and you're sitting next to the right guy because he's talking about changing the vocabulary. Integrity, civility, courage. I'm wondering if you have, because I can tell you young people are hungry for that, they're hungry for replacing it's the economy stupid with it's character America. Do you have any part of your organization that's looking at getting big money 
to invest in branding because if we didn't learn anything from the last election, we learned that branding, that people, it's a, it's a really, really huge struggle we face because when we're bordering on propaganda, um, it's, it's major erosion into democracy. And this is an infusion of democracy. Is there any long-term or like getting to real big money? Because I got to think there are people that would want to get this out there. And you say to America in big messaging, this is what we're about and we are the veterans. And then you're really grabbing onto your credibility and putting it out there. Thank you for your question. Thanks for teaching. Um, if you decide to look for something else, let's talk. Because uh, <laughs> I love that, that passion and enthusiasm behind it. Um, and actually, we partner with the organizations that focus on recruiting teachers as well as uh, uh, in, the, in the political space. Um, I, I, part of the reason I've come to Aspen Ideas is because I've participated for many years with the Bezos Scholars Program. Some of you may be familiar with this. It's a fantastic program. It goes into lower performing schools and has a really rigorous selection process uh, for about 20 young American high school students who are here, to, who, who are here on campus. You might meet some of them. Uh, and are, are, represent something for the, for the future. And um, when, I'm, when I'm with them and with other students, uh, one of the pieces of advice that I humbly offer uh, from, from experience, particularly in entrepreneurial endeavors, is that the, the world is pretty ambivalent. There's a lot of anxiety to just asking for help, but you should just ask. Because in the end of the day, it's kind of a numbers game. And most people aren't going to remember that you asked. And so you, you got to get through, you got to break through that discomfort. It's some, something similar to what political candidates have to do that are running from the military. You got to break through that discomfort. Um, so why do I mention that? I mention it because one of the first things that we did as an organization, I mean, I'm deeply committed. I'm full time in. I put some of my own money into it. I mean, we're, we're deeply into it. One of the first things I did was I reached out to the marketing agency of the United States Marine Corps, J. Walter Thompson. Uh, and, uh, and they said, listen, we don't do any pro bono. You know, we can't do any pro bono. It's just like, we just can't do it. I said, well, but the mission matters. You know, the mission matters. And, uh, and, and they came behind us. And so J. Walter Thompson actually uh, designed our, uh, our, our logo and has and helped out um, now at a, in a discounted way. We, uh, we're, we're super packed, so we don't do um, uh, pure pro bono anymore. But we are building an organization that will hopefully help t change the dialogue. That's part of the reason why I'm here and so fortunate to have folks like David Brooks that are uh, helping to um, you know, spread, spread the word about the, word, the work Let that me, we're doing. I, I should get the concrete uh, details. Like, you're an independent expenditure. Yep. So I assume you're not actually giving money to candidates. Correct. You're yeah. buying outside ads for the candidates. Yep. That's right. So are, you, are all your ads positive? Or are there negative ads you're running? Yeah, we don't take, so we don't take off the table going negative. I think it's important not to. But we say we are going to live by our pledge, which we require all our candidates to do, which is I will not lie or baselessly attack in my ads. So you know, I'll give you an example. We have a candidate that's running against somebody that was under FBI investigation for fraud. Well, voters should know that. And so we will help them uh, know, know that. So yet we don't take things off the table in, in that regard. Um, we have a great team, uh, two political directors who are, who are pretty seasoned, but also that are that are fairly digitally savvy, so that's part of the, the nuts and bolts of how you run is, is how do you reach people that, um, that can really get out there and, and uh, frankly, and, and vote. Uh, maybe right here in the Pasadena hat. I was the first female political appointee at the Navy 40 years ago, <laughs> and they wanted to keep me out of the Pentagon, so they kept sending me out to ships. <laughs> and I have such a large collection of these hats and the world's worst hair, so it covers <laughs> up my hair. Um, first, about asking Apple Computer has the best phrase I've heard, which when they hire their employees, the first thing they tell them is, if you don't know, ask. We all learn together. Now, I wanted to get that to the Pentagon, but in this administration, <laughs> I don't think I could get to the sec, sec def. Um, I called Ash Carter about it, and all I could say is, why didn't you come to me when I could have done something about this? What I really want to ask is, what would be your view if we managed to get federal funding for campaigns and didn't have people who could basically buy their, their way into 
political jobs? I think it's hugely important. I think that structurally there there are two key issues. There's the gerrymandering of districts and you know, 50% or more of the districts in the United States are so gerrymandered they're going to be in one party or another no matter how big of a wave this this way or that way. Which, in, by the way, is part of the reason why it's really important to have organizations that are like ours that are supporting the right candidates in the primaries when they're open seats. I mean, there are over 75 open seats this cycle. And many of those are going to be won or lost within the primary. So do you get a bomb thrower who comes out of the primary and maybe has some extreme dollars behind them, or do you get somebody that's more reasonable? But the second key structural issue really is around the money in politics. I mean, it's absurd. And, and, and I don't like the fact, to be, personal, you know, to be frank, that, that the super PAC environment is there. But it's there. And it's the reality of how candidates either win or, frankly, lose the, these days. And so, so I think uh, the, the path to you know, a campaign finance reform is uh, sort of above my pay grade, to be honest. I don't know how that actually happens. It seems very difficult because it, my understanding is that it, it's essentially a Supreme Court, it's a Supreme Court uh, a decision. But um, but I think that it is. This is this is unfortunately this is part of the reality that the candidates are now facing, and so that's why we're doing what we're doing. And to my knowledge, we are uh, perhaps one of the only, if not the only. Uh, super PAC that's out there that's really operating in a cross-partisan way in, in this way. Most organizations are just hyper-partisan. And of course, most Americans are less partisan. I mean, one of the most stri striking statistics I came across when I decided to jump into this crazy foray uh, and leave the private sector was that in America, 30% of Americans used to be unaffiliated. I happen to be unaffiliated, be part of that group. Now, 10 years later, 40% are unaffiliated. For, for in, in 10 years, I mean, that, that is, those are big numbers. So it's like Americans are becoming less partisan. The parties are going deeper and deeper, um, and something's got to give. I, David, I don't know. You, you've obviously thought, thought a lot, written a lot about this. But. It's hopeless. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I will say one of the things that, that's an advantage, I follow a lot of people who run for office, and their main fear is losing. They have a tremendous fear of failure. And the consultants come in and say, you've got to raise money so you won't lose. And they're in a panic, so they raise a lot of money. And who does the money go to? It's the consultants who are telling them to raise a lot of money. <laughs> and so the, parent, the consultants come in sort of like parasites, like this is how we make our living, exploiting the anxieties of candidates. Yeah. And so it's a total a corrupting system. And often the consultants don't know anything about the local district, and they do a horrible job and get a lot of money. I've become much more hostile to this whole industry because I've seen it ruin people yeah. who are running for office for good reasons. Let's go right here. Thank you both for your, the work you do. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Greg Hammer. I'm from, from Miami, and I'm with a, I represent a, uh, a veteran-founded green jobs training organization based in North Carolina. Huh. And uh, with climate issues being at a foundational uh, driver of the work that we're doing, I'm also with an NGO that just had 1,200 people on Capitol Hill two weeks ago, Tuesday. Uh, and on our advisory board is Rear Admiral Titley, um, and what we're doing is bridging the partisan divide in Congress. That's the NGO side. I, I wanted to, what you spoke about with the Freedom Caucus um, relates to another caucus perhaps you're aware of and I'd like you to get your opinion on, and this is the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus, which now exceeds 80 House members. I think it's uh, 82 now, 41 and 41. 41 Republicans that joined a working group with the word climate in it. That's the work we do at this NGO, CCL, Citizens Climate Lobby. And I'm wondering to what degree do you see the intersection between, well, the work you're doing with helping military people get into office, but we have a big mission, you know. I mean, the, the DOD says that uh, human-caused climate instability is a top national security threat and a, a threat multiplier, right? And so do you have any comments about the caucus, bipartisanship, and perhaps your role in that Bigger mission. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to, it, first of all, that, that's, I mean, it's, it's important to build these coalitions. There are not many that function well. You know, there are not many that are able to get things really done. One of my friends in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, is a guy named Jay Faison, who's set up uh, ClearPath, which is uh, really focused on trying to uh, bring in cleaner energy solutions through, through conservative circles, specifically. Uh, but these are hard solutions. I think at the end of the day, we, we looked at, when our, with our pledge, we looked at, can we add any policy item that could actually cut across both party lines? And it, we couldn't. I mean, it doesn't, it, 
in order to take the broad, so we're trying to do something different by really starting on the character character front. At the end of the day, the cohesion, the, the, the coalitions themselves have to have cohesion. One of the beauties of military is that it is a shared experience. I mean, you talk to some uh, so some of the, the veterans in particular that I know that are in the house right now say that, that um, the, the fact that they are veterans gives them cover to actually talk to somebody, to be seen talking to somebody on the other side. And that's totally absurd. And, it's, 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 but, and it, it wasn't the way that it used to be. I mean, right, you have these you know, senators in a way and Dole coming together and, and actually getting past, you know, major stuff done. There are plenty of examples in history. But right now we're at a point where um, it's so caustic that a lot of folks don't feel like they can even be seen um, together. So I, I think the coalitions do matter and the cohesion of the coalitions matter. I'll just say in conclusion, we're 14 seconds left. Uh, one of the things I think about a lot is in the World War II era or in, since then, we had a very small elite. Governing class was basically white males, mostly of Protestant descent. And now we have a much broader and fairer elite. And yet I wouldn't say we're better governed than back then. And it's a paradox to me that we made society so much more open to talent and so much fairer. And, but I wouldn't say our institutions are working better. And so what did they have that we don't have that compensated for this? And I think it was service experience because they might have gone to Chode and Yale and places like that. But in the Marine Corps, the Army, the Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, they served with people who were up and down the class scale. And that's just a huge advantage that a lot of people who were, you know, otherwise went to those schools don't have. And I think that's one of the reasons they, they actually had some better governance that you could be George Marshall or Dwight Eisenhower, but you knew, you know, you knew, or Douglas MacArthur, who came from a super high-end family, but you know what it was like to live in Des Moines or Dubuque or, or anywhere else. So anyway, the, in, in conclusion to say, it's gonna take a lot to turn our politics around, but this is certainly part of the solution. So thank, thank you, you, Ryan. Thanks, David. Really appreciate it.